Good evening. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you're able to join us for tonight's lecture. A Kentucky Portia, Sophonispa Breckenridge, first woman lawyer in the Bluegrass State with Anya Jabour. Dr. Jabour is Regents Professor of History at the University of Montana and the author of Sophonispa Breckenridge, Championing Women's Activism in Modern America, the first biography of a forgotten feminist who advanced women's rights, racial justice, and social welfare in 20th century America. Her scholarship has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Huffington Post. The author of numerous books and articles about women, families, and children in the 19th century South, Jabour served as an on-set historical advisor for the PBS Civil War miniseries, Mercy Street. She also served as a state coordinator for an online biographical dictionary of suffragist activists soliciting and editing more than 80 biographical sketches of lesser known suffragists. She's the director of, Pub of the public history program at the University of Montana. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anya Jabour. Thank you so much, Patrick, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm um, really excited to be here at the Filson virtually. Um, I actually was scheduled to be there in person right before the pandemic hit. Um, and so I probably uh, spent more time pestering Patrick than most speakers, but hopefully it will be well worth it. In 1897, the Texas Daily Herald ran a story about a native Lexingtonian under the headline, A Kentucky Portia. The subject of the story was Miss Sophonisba Preston Breckenridge, eldest daughter of Colonel William Colonel Breckenridge, the renowned orator, ex-congressman and lawyer, who had recently been admitted to practice law before the Court of Appeals, thus becoming the first woman to be accorded that privilege in Kentucky. Noting that Miss Breckenridge had been one of the first women admitted to the state's flagship university, the reporter explained that she had subsequently earned degrees from Wellesley College and the University of Chicago, as well as studying law both in Europe and in her father's law office in Lexington. Praising Miss Breckenridge as a young woman of pleasing personality and attractive appearance, the reporter also noted that she is a brilliant conversationalist, equally at home on all the leading questions of the day, the law, social science, and political economy. Small wonder then that the reporter opined, Miss Breckenridge is unusually well equipped for the practice of her profession. Sophie Nisba Breckenridge, Nisba to her family and friends, had struggled for years to attain legal training and gain admission to the bar. Yet shortly after this article was printed, she abandoned both her legal career and her home state of Kentucky to move to Chicago, where she became a social science researcher, a social work professor, and a social justice advocate. Although she never again practiced law, she used her hard-won legal expertise to promote legislation to address the nation's most pressing problems. This presentation will address her lengthy struggle to achieve her legal ambitions, her brief and troubled legal career, and her lasting legislative legacy. Ultimately, the Kentucky Portia would become an important and effective advocate for social justice in modern America. Like many other future feminists of her generation, Nisba enjoyed a close relationship with her father. According to family legend, even before Nisba could walk, he taught her the alphabet by pointing out the letters in his law books, imbuing her with a lifelong reverence for both learning and law. WCP also impressed his favorite daughter with the importance of both high achievement and public service encouraging her to join the ranks of new women who sought higher education, financial independence, and public influence in turn of the century America. The Breckenridge name has been connected 
with good intellectual work for some generations, he counseled. You must preserve this connection for the next generation. By frequently taking her with him to his law offices in downtown Lexington, located in or near the courthouse, he inspired her to preserve the connection by pursuing a career in law. An enthusiastic advocate of women's education, he also facilitated Nisba's enrollment at age 14 at Kentucky Agricultural and Mechanical College. Although she excelled in her coursework there, Nisba also encountered significant gender discrimination and she did not obtain a degree from the future University of Kentucky. In 1884, 18 year old Nisba persuaded her parents to allow her to go north to attend Wellesley College where she spent four years preparing for a professional life as she put it in one letter home. Although aware that her most viable option for self-support was teaching, Nisba preferred to envision herself following in her father's footsteps by practicing law. However, because most law schools were closed to women at the time, and because most lawyers prepared for the bar by assisting established lawyers in their practice, she assumed that she would read law in her father's office after completing her studies rather than attending law school. Nonetheless, Nisba found ways to prepare for a legal career at Wellesley College. In addition to pursuing a dual degree in Latin and mathematics, she completed coursework in logic, rhetoric, composition, and debate. She was especially fond of debate. On one occasion, she appealed to her father for guidance when her debate topic was whether lawyers should defend their clients when they know they are guilty. Nisba also devoted special attention to legal issues in her extracurricular activities. For instance, she attended a series of lectures on women's citizenship and common law that addressed the legal framework of the covered woman, whereby a married woman's legal identity was subsumed by her husband's and she became incapable of holding property or making contracts. Knowledge of Latin, a problem-solving outlook, logical thinking, and debate experience all would serve Nisba well in the law. Nisba's interest in women's legal status also foreshadowed her future career as a women's rights advocate. Thus, when Nisba graduated from Wellesley in 1888, her classmates assumed she would pursue a career in law. The class civil predicted that the Southern Nightingale, as she called her, would become an advocate before the law, an accomplished lawyer who pleaded for the poor shop girl and the helpless widow. Nisba intended to follow the route laid out in the class prophecy. I had promised myself to be a lawyer, she reflected in her autobiography. After earning her bachelor's degree, Nisba hoped to study and practice law in her father's office. However, WCP, a favorite of the Democratic Party who served in Congress from 1885 until 1895, had little time or inclination to tutor his daughter. Although he continued to practice law, he devoted most of his limited time at his Lexington Law Office to training his eldest son, Deshay, as his partner and successor. WCP's decision to focus his attentions on a son who showed no, particularly no particular interest in or aptitude for law, rather than on a daughter who yearned to pursue a legal career and had used her college years to prepare for legal study, must have been a terrible disappointment for Nisba. However, she never commented on this irony in her memoirs. Instead, she blamed herself for what she called her stupid reasoning in pursuing a liberal arts education and what she deemed her foolish decision to attend Wellesley College rather than the University of Michigan, which had begun the dangerous experiment of admitting women in 1870, offering a handful of intrepid women the opportunity to earn a law degree. It is pitiful to recall how my college work had failed in every way to help me toward a profession, she reflected painfully. 
I was no nearer earning my living when I came back from college than when I had left home four years before. In point of fact, however, gender discrimination more than individual decisions limited educated women's options in turn of the century America. In 1920, Nisba pointed to discrimination as the primary barrier to women's success in the legal profession. In the field of corporate law, she observed, men are ready to use women to the fullest extent as secretaries, but not to take them on as equals in the game. Where criminal law was concerned, the man lawyer is given by politicians at the top all sorts of channels and avenues through which he can climb, while woman is handicapped in this in intrigue. Finally, women found it nearly impossible to pursue the advanced training that was increasingly necessary. Women have always needed to have better training than men for the same work, she observed, yet the best law schools are still closed to women. Like many other new women of her generation, Nisba found that the family claim further limited her options. Like most unmarried women of her generation, Nisba felt obligated to assist her family. In Nisba's case, her sense of duty was heightened by her mother's delicate health. Nisba's need to be useful to her family, combined with the limited options for women, to prevent her from pursuing legal studies. As she later explained, at that time, there were not many law schools open to women. My mother's health was frail and the family expenses were high. The only law school open to women in Washington had classes in the evening. And that was when I could be of service at home. Thwarted in her legal ambitions, Nisba instead took a job teaching mathematics. She continued to dream of a different future, however. In 1890, she was inspired by meeting suffrage leader Susan B. Anthony. A later New York Times article indicated that in addition to attempting to indoctrinate Nisba with women's rights principles, the suffragists also encouraged the younger woman to pursue her professional goals. Nisba soon had a new opportunity to study law. In May 1891, after a severe bout, severe bout with influenza forced her to give up her teaching post, Nisba's parents sent her abroad in charge of her younger sister, 15-year-old Curry. Following in the footsteps of other American women who responded to limited opportunities at home by pursuing higher education overseas, Nisba found a professor in Europe who was willing to instruct her and undertook private tutoring in French and Roman law. Nisba began to investigate the possibility of attending law school at the University of Michigan upon her return to the United States. However, even when separated from her parents by an ocean, she could not help but wonder if they would approve. Like so many women of her generation who felt compelled to answer the family claim, she worried that while her dream was to pursue law, her duty was to serve her family. Curry explained, she is quite undecided whether it is her duty to stay at home or learn law. How the Breckenridges might have responded to Nisba's plan remains a mystery. Shortly after Curry confided to them on the subject, Issa contracted dysentery and WCP sent funds to permit the Breckenridge girls to return home immediately. Hastily boarding a ship for America, Nisba and Curry arrived home only to find their mother had already expired. Issa's sudden death was a terrible shock. It also struck a devastating blow to Nisba's plans for the future. Expected to maintain order at home, Nisba once more put her own goals on hold. She did not enroll in law school. Instead, she assumed responsibility for keeping house and educating Curry. While Nisba was willing to postpone law school, she also was determined to pursue her dream of practicing law. Within a few months of returning home to Kentucky, she was ready to launch her long delayed legal career. 
at the time, local admission to the bar depended largely on informal apprenticeships and ad hoc oral examinations. In order to qualify to practice at the county level, would-be attorneys at law in Kentucky simply had to take an oath that the candidate had never participated in a duel. Nisba took the oath and joined her father's office in the autumn of 1892 near the Fayette County Courthouse. Although newspapers around the country ran the story that she was practicing law, Nisba appears rather to have been a, an apprentice or a clerk in her father's office. Nonetheless, women's page editors celebrated her as Kentucky's first woman lawyer. She has been admitted to the bar with the approval of her distinguished father, one such account read. While some mainstream newspapers minimized her achievement by listing it under headlines like feminine fancies, it seemed that Nisba had at last reached her goal of practicing law alongside her father. Unfortunately, WCP's legal difficulties almost immediately overshadowed his daughter's legal ambitions. In spring 1893, only months after Nisba qualified for the bar and less than a year after Issa's death, WCP secretly remarried a cousin, Louise Wing. Almost immediately, another woman, Madeline Pollard, filed suit in a Washington DC court for breach of promise, claiming that WCP had reneged on his promise to marry her. She further averred that she and the de defendant had engaged in a lengthy extramarital affair that began shortly after their first meeting on April the 1st, 1884, which happened to be Nisva's 18th birthday and continued into 1893 during and after Issa's final illness. Testifying that the illicit relationship had resulted in the birth of two children, she also presented evidence that the affair continued throughout WCP's term in office. After conceiving a third time, shortly after Issa's death, Pollard secured promise of marriage, only to miscarry and then to learn that her lover had married another woman. Unable to deny the affair in the face of overwhelming evidence, WCP instead fought the suit by impugning the plaintiff's character. He assembled a team of lawyers and detectives, including Nisba, to collect information to convince the judge that at the time of the initial encounter, when he was 47 and Pollard was 17, that Pollard was an experienced seductress rather than an innocent schoolgirl. Instead of beginning her own practice, Nisba spent her first year as a practicing attorney taking testimonials from boarding house keepers, chambermaids, and staff at the found, Foundling Hospital and Orphanage where Pollard gave birth, hoping to establish reasonable doubt that her own father was also the father of Pollard's children. The case turned out badly for everybody. Although the court found WCP guilty and awarded compensation to Pollard, the lawsuit bankrupted him and destroyed his political career. WCP lost his bid for reelection and Pollard got nothing. Determined to be a dutiful daughter, Nisba prioritized family demands over professional opportunities to the detriment of her own health and happiness. She relinquished her renewed plans to study law at the University of Michigan when she learned of her father's objections. Assuring him that she was very well and able to work, she vowed, I would not give you cause for anxiety for the world. And it seems to me now, I cannot go. Instead of going to law school, she kept house for her father, cared for her mentally ill stepmother, and tutored her younger sister. While Nisba declared herself willing to relinquish what she called any false desire for independence to assist her father, the sacrifice took a toll. Nisba's physical and mental health declined dramatically. 
As she later recalled by the mid 1890s, the question of my health and my future became acute. By 1894, WCP had become so concerned about Nisba's melancholy, sleeplessness and weight loss that he sent her to visit a college friend in Chicago. There, she met Marion Talbot, the Dean of Women at the University of Chicago, who encouraged Nisba to pursue graduate studies at the coeducational school. Nisba enrolled at the University of Chicago in fall 1895, where she spent what she called a wonderful year taking almost exclusively courses with Professor Freund. Ernst Freund was an innovative and influential legal scholar who promoted sociological jurisprudence or the use of the legal system to promote social justice. It was doubtless Freund's legal expertise that attracted the would-be law student to a school that as yet had no law school. Studying with Freund brought Nisba as close as possible to her long-time goal of studying law. Studying with Freund also introduced Nisba to new theories about social justice and public policy. At the time that she met him, Freund was writing and lecturing from drafts of his path-breaking book, The Police Power. Published in 1904, The Police Power advocated using the power of the state to promote social welfare. In handwritten notes that informed both his classes and his book, Freund pondered how public power could advance humanitarian work. He argued that social legislation, such as laws regulating the labor of women and children, was both a proper use of state power and a sensible response to industrial conditions. Presenting his students with information about such current issues as poor relief, juvenile justice, and labor legislation, Freund continued, contended that laws reflected changing standards of social justice. He challenged his students to envision themselves as activists of the law. Breckenridge wholeheartedly adopted Freund's views, becoming a lifelong advocate of socialized justice. At the conclusion of the school year, however, she returned home to Lexington because, as she later stated, we did not have the money for me to go back to Chicago. Determined to complete her master's degree, she maintained a pro forma student status at the university and chose a topic she could research in Lexington, the early judicial system of Kentucky. She completed the thesis in less than a year and was awarded a master's degree in political science in 1897. While working on her thesis, Nisba also took steps to establish a legal career. I spent a good deal of time in my father's office, she later recalled. This time, WCP supported his daughter's studies, suggesting that instead of reading Blackstone, whose classic compendium of English common law explained judge-made law based on precedent, she should read Adams on equity. Equity law was a separate but parallel form of law based on contract that differed in several respects from English common law. One of the most significant ways that equity law differed from common law pertained to women's legal status. Under English common law, married women suffered from civil death. Their identity was covered by that of their husbands, and they literally had no identity in the eyes of the law. Under equity law, however, women had certain legal rights and protections, including more legal grounds for divorce and some provisions for maternal custody of children, as well as financial support following divorce. John Adams' Doctrine of Equity, first published in 1850 and reissued in 1890, addressed these issues. WCP probably recommended this book because he presumed that his daughter would specialize in family law. He may also have suggested it to encourage her interest in women's rights. In addition to reading law in her father's office, Nisba sought further qualifications as a lawyer. 
Although she had qualified to practice law in the lower courts five years earlier, in order to practice in the appellate courts, candidates had to undergo an examination and be found competent by the judges at the Court of Appeals in Frankfort, Kentucky. In January 1897, while accompanying her brother to Frankfort, Nisba seized the opportunity to ask the Chief Justice, one of her father's messmates from the Confederate Army, to let me try an examination. After he and two other justices questioned her for several hours in the judges' chambers in the beautiful old court building, they unanimously agreed that she was qualified to practice and administered the oath on the spot making her the first woman qualified to practice in the state's appellate courts. Newspapers around the country were fascinated by the story of Kentucky's first woman lawyer. Nearly all accounts called attention to Nisba's famous family, her extensive education, and her personal appearance. One laudatory account in the Atchison, Kansas Daily Globe pointing out that Breckenridge's had been practicing law for more than a century noted, the new woman is almost unknown in Kentucky, but all of Lexington and especially her father and brothers are very proud of Miss Nisba's achievements and her friends predict for her a brilliant legal career. As she had done five years earlier when she initially qualified to practice law, Nisba continued to work in her father's office. Newspaper reports indicated that her father supported her ambitions to a point. According to one report, she had a desk in her father's firm, but WCP was adamant that she was not a partner in the offices of Breckenridge and Shelby, where he was senior partner and John Shelby was junior partner. Nisba herself told reporters that she does not intend to practice for some time yet unless there should be an unusual demand for her services. However, she quickly began to establish a practice of her own. One of Nisba's first cases was that of an abused wife, Elizabeth Swigert. Although the new lawyer declined to discuss the case with reporters and characterized it as simply a plain divorce case, the Swigert's domestic situation was a, an especially pathetic and dramatic one as one journalist expressed it. Fearing for her life, the wife fled with her five children on a frigid winter night, only to be pursued by the enraged husband who asserted his authority as the children's sole legal guardian and physically removed them from her care. Mrs. Swigert appealed to the Kentucky Portia for assistance in obtaining a divorce, reclaiming her main name, and gaining custody of her children. Both small town and big city newspapers were fascinated by Kentucky's first woman lawyer's first lawsuit. The Paris Kentucky Bourbon News ridiculed Breckenridge's efforts with the snide remark, Miss Breckenridge is an accomplished typewriter and the petition is an excellent specimen of her work. Repeating the dismissive comment about Breckenridge's typing abilities, the Kansas City, Missouri Journal also patronizingly noted that the divorce papers tied with a neat blue satin ribbon were the neatest and clearest court papers filed for a long time. However, the journal also added that the petition sets forth the case far more tersely than many of the lawyers of the opposite sex could do. The New York Times took a more favorable view. Repeating the extraneous details about the appearance of the petition, but also pointing out that every member of the Lexington Bar had examined it and opined that Miss Breckenridge has an excellent case and so no doubt will win her first suit at law. However, Kentucky's first woman lawyer faced an uphill battle in her first lawsuit. By state law, a woman could sue for divorce only on grounds of abandonment, the husband's alcoholism where linked to non-support, or marital cruelty. Kentucky jurists define cruelty as including cruel beating or injury 
resulting in probable danger to her life or great bodily injury. This definition clearly supported Mrs. Swigert's claim to divorce. However, the issue of child custody was more complicated. Kentucky statutes did not address the issue of child custody. By English common law, which applied by default where no statute existed, a father was the only legal guardian of his children. However, mothers could sue for custody in equity court. Over the 19th century, they were increasingly successful in such cases, at least where younger children were concerned, as judges applied the emerging but informal doctrine of making decisions in the best interests of the child. Thus, Mrs. Swigert's request, not only for an absolute divorce, but also for custody of the children and the restoration of her maiden name, made the case more than a plain divorce case. NISPA established firm grounds for a divorce on the ground of cruelty. Her petition asserted that Mr. Swigert had behaved in so cruel and inhuman a manner as to permanently destroy Mrs. Swigert's peace and happiness and has made such attempts to injure her as to indicate probable danger to her life. However, it was more difficult to contest Mr. Swigert's legal claim to the couple's five children. Pushing the emerging doctrine of the child's best interests as far as she could, Nisba persuaded the judge to award Mrs. Swigert custody of the three youngest children, but Mr. Swigert retained custody of the two eldest. Although the highly publicized case brought enough business to prevent Nisba from accepting out of town speaking invitations, it also may have dampened her enthusiasm for practicing law. Many years later, she told an interviewer that dealing with the broken down family was hard on the young woman lawyer. While speaking in general terms, Nisba may have had the Swigert case in mind. The infamous lawsuit against her father also may have cast a shadow over her burgeoning career. It is also possible that Nisba found the day-to-day -day practice of the law in her father's office dissatisfying. Her later comment that men are ready to use women to the fullest extent as secretaries, but not to take them on as equals, might have been directed at her father, who so pointedly downplayed her role in his office. In any rate, evidently even a moderately successful legal practice was not rewarding enough for her to resist the opportunity to return to Chicago for further education. As she later recalled, when Miss Talbot snatched for me a fellowship in political science, which a man student had resigned, I came back to the university and have remained ever since. Nispa spent the next four years happily working for my degree at the University of Chicago, taking courses in both political science and political economy and completing her PhD with high honors in 1901. However, when she completed her graduate studies, she was unable to secure a faculty position. Swallowing her disappointment, she enrolled in the university's new law school where she resumed work with her former advisor, Ernst Freund. Gaining advanced standing by transferring much of her previous coursework in political science into law, Nisba completed her degree in just two years. She graduated at the top of her class with honors in June 1904, the first woman in the US to earn a law degree. 20 years after matriculating at Wellesley, Nisba had finally achieved her lifelong dream of graduating from law school. Newspapers continued to revel in news of Nisba's accomplishments, often including them on the women's pages. For instance, the St. Paul Globe included a notice about her achievement in a column for the fair sex beneath an illustration of the latest fashions. Nisba probably intended to return home to Kentucky and join her father's law practice. WCP's support, however limited it may have been in the past, would have been essential to her success in the future. As newspapers fascination with the Kentucky Portia indicated, female lawyers remained an anomaly in the early 20th century. 
and female practitioners had very limited opportunities. The key to a successful practice for most women lawyers was a partnership with a male family member. Thus, returning to her father's law office, even if she did so as an apprentice or clerk, remained Nisba's most viable option for a career in law. However, before she could take this step, WCP died, severing her strongest tie to Kentucky. Much as she mourned her beloved father's death, it also freed Nisba from the family claim to explore opportunities in Chicago. She might have continued her career in law there. However, by the time she graduated from law school, she seems to have become disillusioned with the practice of the law. The two most significant legal cases in which she was involved, her father's defense and Emily Swigert's divorce, both highlighted the ways in which the law functioned to maintain male privilege. In addition, Nisba's studies at the university had awakened her interest in making law rather than practicing law in using the law to advance social justice rather than upholding laws that enforced social inequality. As she reflected, the laws are so unjust that instead of wanting to help carry them out, the woman law lawyer wants to get to work to change them. Therefore, we find many women lawyers in political and public work. Nisba would never practice law again after her short-lived Kentucky career. Instead, she would apply legal thinking to social problems. My book explores Nisba's later career in more detail. For now, I just want to give you a sense of how she used her brief legal career as the basis for lasting legislative solutions to social ills. In Chicago, Nisba taught at the University of Chicago directed research at the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy, and became a resident of Hull House, a hub of reform activity. Because of her knowledge of the law, she quickly became the go-to person to draft and promote what her Hull House colleagues called social legislation, laws and policies to promote social justice. Although social legislation had multiple applications, I'll give you just two examples, labor legislation and welfare legislation. First, labor legislation. After investigating the horrific conditions of women workers in Chicago's packing houses in 1906, Nisba launched a lengthy campaign for labor legislation, writing a series of articles promoting so-called protective legislation for women workers. That is, state laws regulating working women's hours, wages, and working conditions. Nisba continued to campaign for labor legislation at both the state and the federal level for the rest of her life. And in 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act finally established maximum hours and minimum wages for all workers. Shortly after she initiated her campaign for labor legislation, Nisba also became an influential advocate of welfare legislation. With Edith Abbott, a colleague who would soon become her life partner, she conducted research in the records of the Chicago Juvenile Court for its first 10 years of operation. Based on this data, in 1910, she presented a pro proposal for public assistance for single mothers. The following year, Illinois enacted the nation's first so-called mother's pension. That program became the template for similar programs throughout the nation. Nisba became a leading advocate for financial support for needy families. Ultimately, she helped ensure that a similar program would be incorporated into the federal welfare state under the Social Security Act of 1935. Nisba Breckenridge, who learned her letters from her father's law books, traveled a long road in order to reach her lifelong dream of studying and practicing law. Although her family, especially her beloved father, sometimes supported her in her aims, the family claim and her father's demands 
also thwarted her ambitions, as did pervasive gender discrimination in the legal profession. Eventually, Nisba managed to become a practicing attorney in her father's office and to earn a law degree. However, her two most important cases, her father's breach of promise case and an abused wife's divorce case, demonstrated the ways in which the law failed to protect women's interests or promote social justice. Abandoning day-to-day -day legal practice, Nisba instead used what she called legal thinking to promote social legislation, including labor legislation and welfare legislation. Although she never again practiced law after leaving Kentucky, the Kentucky Portia used her legal background to become one of the most important social reformers of the progressive and New Deal eras. Thank you so much, and I look forward to talking with you more about Nisba's career. Well, thank you so much, Anya. That was a really enjoyable presentation. And thank you not only for, for this research, but, but really all of the work that you've done to help us better understand the lives of women of, of this generation. Um, and, and sort of thinking about this generation, you know, we talked a lot about gender here, but especially being the daughter of a Confederate officer. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about her views on race. Absolutely. That's a great question, Patrick. So interestingly, uh, Nisba ultimately also became an advocate of racial equality. Um, she uh, was a founding member of the um, Chicago chapter of what would eventually become uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, she was uh, a very strong proponent of a federal anti-lynching law, something she never gave up advocating for. And in fact, interestingly, she planted editorials in the Lexington newspaper that her brother Deshay edited um, uh, so that they would appear to be from, by a, you know, by a local, right? Um, advocating a federal anti-lynching law um, it was a it was a, a tough road for her to get there. Um, she um, her attending Wellesley really was the turning point for her because she uh, Wellesley uh, was one of the only seven sisters to uh, admit um, African American students on an equal basis, and she became good friends with a fellow classics student, um, Ella Smith was her name, and um, you can kind of see her evolving racial. Um, ideas in her interactions with Ella Smith. When she first met Ella, she referred to her as Miss Smith using scare quotes, right? Because of course, racial etiquette dictated that a white person never accord an African-American person an honorific, right? So calling Ella Smith by an honorific was sort of uncomfortable. And you could see that initially when she wrote home about her and, and put her name in those, in those quotes. But ultimately, she ended up arguing um, against some of her classmates that Ella Smith should be allowed not only to attend the big junior promenade, which was like the social event at Wellesley, but also to invite her guests. Um, and so sort of she later in her autobiography describes that as her kind of epiphany uh, when it came to race relations and thereafter um, was very strongly committed to racial equality. Um, but yes, it was, it, was not, it was not an incredibly easy thing for the daughter of very avid Confederates. Her mother also was a strong Confederate supporter and engaged in Confederate memorialization efforts. Um, uh, her father built his uh, political career on redeeming um, the state's politics um, uh, and regaining white democratic control of the state. Um, including doing things like uh, coming up with the brilliant idea of the capitation tax, which was Kentucky's version of the poll tax that denied um, recently enfranchised black men the right to vote. Anyway, so yeah, it was a it was a it was a journey for her, but she was definitely always very concerned, or at least post Wellesley, very concerned with racial issues as well as gender equality. Fantastic. We had a really excellent question come in through the chat and I would remind everyone in the audience, if you do have any questions, uh, please drop them in the chat there. We also have a donation link if you'd like to support the Filson um, for this programming. Uh, we had a question about pronunciation 
um, <laughs> and and Nispa and and how do you pronounce the, the her entire name? And and did that did that trip people up during her life as much as it tends to do us now? Oh well, I can't really answer the second part of that question, um, but I can answer the first. And um, I when I the whole time I worked on this book for about 10 years and the entire time I was working on it, I was not entirely sure if it was Sopanisba or Sopanisba. Actually, after the book was published, I finally found an oral history from Kentucky that was by someone who had known her uh, during her lifetime and that person pronounced it Sopanisba. Um, and so that had already been my leaning because her nickname was, well, N-I-S-B-A and it just sounded strange to me to say Nisba. I mean, Sofa Nisba sounds fine, but Nisba sounds odd. So I thought it had to be Nisba. So it had to be Sofa Nisba. Anyway, the oral history finally set my mind at ease um, that, that I was right about, uh, about that. Um, so that was, that was a, a late breaking discovery <laughs> that made me feel a lot better. The archive sometimes gives us uh, little clues like that. I remember another branch of the, the Breckenridge family uh, once had to clarify to a correspondent uh, that you may tell the rabble that the name is Cabell. I always <laughs> oh, love that's that one. I like it. <laughs> um, uh, another really excellent question. You mentioned Hull House. What was the influence of Jane Addams on Nisba? Jane Addams had a tremendous influence on Nisba. So Nisba throughout her life was really fortunate to have a whole series of really important mentors, um, both men and women. Um, Ernst Freund, who I mentioned, obviously was a really important influence on her thoughts about the law and the role of law in society. Um, but Jane Addams and Hull House more generally were kind of Nisba's entree into really putting those principles into practice um, and translating her legal expertise into public policies that would actually sort of make a difference on the ground. Um, Adams also, um, was the person who, in Chicago, who really pushed Nisba to engage in civil rights activism. And, and in fact, um, Adams kind of appointed Nisba sort of her lieutenant in charge of race relations. So every time Adams would get um, a letter about some something, um, you know, either an incident of racial violence or an African American woman seeking professional opportunities. I mean, there's a whole sort of gamut. She would forward them on to Nisba. And Jane Adams, if any of you have studied her, know she, Jane Adams had absolutely horrendous handwriting. So she would just scrawl across the letter, you know, dear lady, that's what she called Nisba, dear lady, um, you know, I'm sorry to bother with this, you with this, but I know you'll do a wonderful job, J.A and you know, just sort of dash it off. And so um, I'm not sure if, uh, if Nisba's uh, collegiate awakening about race relations would have uh, come to so much had Jane Addams not been constantly pushing her um, as a Southerner herself, um, probably also as the daughter of um, really um, unrepentant Confederates um, to take a lead on promoting racial justice. It is, it is ironic because the, the Southerners at the time always tend to seize the mantle of, we, we understand the race question better than, than almost anyone else. And, and in fact, she did, but she, she was working in the opposite direction as a previous generation and lots of folks in her generation as well. Yes, yes. Um, you gave a, a couple of examples of, of social legislation, speaking of, of this, and, and you teased at the very end, uh, you know, surviving in through the New Deal. Uh, I wonder if you could give some continuing examples from later in the career of how she continues to use this legal education in different ways outside of the courtroom. Sure. Well, one of the last cases that she was involved in, although she was not the lawyer, is Yet another case that kind of highlighted the limits of the law when it came to promoting social justice and women's interests in particular. And this was probably in 1908, although the record um, is scanty and unfortunately the legal um, files um, from that era are not in existence any longer. I forget if it was a flood or a fire, but you know something destroyed all of the records. But the case involved a young woman, uh, an immigrant uh, from Austria 
who uh, came to the United States, um, poverty stricken, alone, took a job in a saloon and um, became uh, the object of her employer's uh, advances um, and for his child. And so Nisba was determined to get justice for this woman. She accompanied her to court um, and, and sued um, to, and it's not quite clear what she sued under, but I think it's really interesting that she might have sued under the so-called um, uh, heart balm statutes, which is the sort of same suite of laws that Madeline Pollard had sued her father over, right? Um, a, a sort of a breach of promise thing, uh, because it was much easier to prove breach of promise than it was to prosecute rape. Um, but in any event, um, unfortunately, the records are scanty, so I cannot determine exactly how she went about this legal case, but in any event, she lost. Um, and so uh, I, if, if she'd had any desire to return to the law, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that would have uh, that would have uh, put a nail in that coffin. Um, but she stayed involved in the law in really interesting ways. So one of the really interesting ways that she was involved in the law in the 1930s was that there was, uh, she had actually been instrumental in establishing what was known as Chicago's Morals Court, um, which had been established in 1913. It was a specialized court to deal with women who were accused of prostitution. And the idea was that the court would funnel social services um, toward women who showed up in that court. Of course, that ended up not being how it had worked at all. Um, the morals court was just a travesty of justice. The women were subjected to involuntary, invasive gynecological examinations. Um, any evidence of venereal disease was taken as presumptive evidence of their guilt um, of prostitution. They could be um, sentenced basically to a year in a so-called lock hospital um, for treatment for venereal disease without ever having a day in court. <laughs> I mean, it was terrible. So then in the 1930s, Breckenridge, who had played a role in establishing this court in the first place, uh, launched a campaign um, to eliminate the involuntary exams um, to ensure uh, legal counsel uh, for the women who appeared uh, before the bar uh, in that court um, to ensure that they were actually allowed to post bail um, in, in the meantime, and also uh, just sort of more generally attacking the whole system of this sexual double standard in which women who engaged in prostitution were prosecuted, whereas men who engaged in prostitution, either as pimps or as patrons, uh, were not. And she wrote extensively about you know, how, how unfair uh, the system was, which I think is another really interesting thing because of course, the sexual double standard had played a really important role in her father's lawsuit with Madeline Pollard back in the day. And at the time in the 1890s, Nezza had been being a dutiful daughter and trying to support her father in his legal case. Um, but you know, 30 plus years on, he of course had had passed on himself um, instead of she kind of came full circle. Um, and instead of defending a man, um, she defended, in this case, the women uh, who appeared in the morals court. Um, and she did succeed in all of her reforms. She also got them jury trials and got women on the jury, um, which was a, a big fight um, in Illinois as in other places. Got a, a, a question to pull back a little bit um, from, from uh, this presentation tonight, but to think more broadly about, about your work and not only on this book, but the public history work, the public scholarship that you've been engaged in and the, the centennial of women's suffrage that we've had um, over the past year has seen this really this explosion of books and articles and everything else. Uh, I wonder what, what, we, what we know now and what we need to know. What, uh, what new questions do we have from this recent sort of explosion of new scholarship and public awareness of, of this generation of, of women's activism? That is a great question. I think one of the things that um, not just my work on Breckenridge, but also for instance, um, Alison Parker's biography of Mary Church Terrell um, and Kathleen Cahill's new book, um, Recasting the Vote, which is about um, women of color um, in the suffrage struggle is the, 
is the way that all of these issues of social justice are so interwoven, right? So that it's not just about racial justice and it's not just about gender equity and it's not just about um, class struggles. It's about all of those things and more all at the same time, always. And so, you know, we have this notion that because Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality um, recently, that it's a recent concept. And in terms of us having that word for it, yes. Um, but a lot of activists in the suffrage era, um, some of them who defined themselves as suffragists and some who did not necessarily, they, you know, they lived intersectionality. Their activism was inherently intersectional. And they were always, like Nisba, working on multiple fronts to advance rights for multiple groups of people. And I think um, that now that we've got uh, an up and coming generation of activists who are also engaging in activism on multiple fronts, uh, it may be helpful um, to remind ourselves that Yes, it's hard to it's hard to engage in activism on multiple fronts. <laughs> uh, that is not an easy task, but people have done it before, and truly, it does work better than being a single issue activist. Um, it really does promote justice in a you know more comprehensive and inclusive kind of way. And you know, if they could do it, you know, a hundred years ago, surely <laughs> we can follow their example now. Well, that's a great response. Thank you so much. We're gonna we're gonna bottle that and sell it. Um, <laughs> under, uh, we got a, a one last question from Facebook before we wrap up tonight. Uh, could it be said that Nispa went as far as she did professionally and academically because of her father, and and not necessarily uh, in spite of him? Well, that's a great question. Um, I should say that Nispa herself always gave her father all the credit in the world. In fact, um, she didn't intend to write her own autobiography. She intended to write his biography. And then she said she found that she couldn't write about him without writing about herself. And she couldn't write about herself without writing about him. So it, it all got kind of um, to be this kind of mishmash. Um, so yeah, absolutely. He was, um, he, he was incredibly supportive in, <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> um, and, um, I mean, he, he, he made it possible for her to attend what would become the University of Kentucky. He made it possible for her to attend Wellesley. Um, she paid her own way um, through the University of Chicago, um, but, uh, but he you know, didn't um, eventually uh, didn't object uh, to that. But at the same time, he really, he had a really hard time reconciling his recognition of Nisba's extraordinary talents and intellect with his expectations of what an unmarried daughter should be. And the theme of duty, I mean, in their correspondence is just pervasive. Um, and so I am not sure, um, had he lived longer, um, she probably would not have accomplished as much because she probably would have gone back home and practiced in his office and he might have gradually given her more um, credit. Um, maybe she would eventually have, you know, managed to make junior partner in his office. Maybe not, hard to say. Um, uh, so I guess I would say, you know, he, he definitely provided some of the really important um, the basis, um, the sort of the launching pad for what she did. But she might not have been able to actually launch off of that and go further um, and make her reputation on the national and the international stage um, uh, had he uh, continued to be um, in her life after 1904. Well, that's a great place to, to wrap up for tonight. Anya Dubor, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us. I encourage everyone watching to go out and pick up a copy of the book. Um, wonderful questions uh, from everyone. Uh, have a great night. Thank you.